Uh, what I'd like to focus on today are kind of some tips for thinking through what's wrong with my plant. When you go out and look at a plant and it's got something eaten away or there's spots on the leaves or it's wilting or uh, all of those kinds of things, how do we think about that? Uh, you know, it's one thing to just memorize what black spot of roses looks like. But if you'd never heard of black spot and you walked up to a rose and saw something on the leaves, how would you process what might have caused that? And that's kind of what we want to focus on uh, today. Just want to make sure everybody can see the slides. Paul, is that, are they showing up okay? Uh, Skip, it looks good on this end, yes. Okay, good, thank you. All right, well, let's start off, and I'm not going to do a lot of theory today, but I do have to start at least with the first slide just with some basic concepts and ideas, and then we'll get right down into the hands-on type of, of photos and things. But good earth kind practices start with learning to identify pests and diseases. In the old Western movies, uh, the guys wore white and black hats, and you could tell whether it was a good guy or a bad guy uh, by the color of the hat they wore. Well, bugs don't wear hats, unfortunately, and a lot of uh, innocent bugs or even beneficial bugs get sprayed and killed uh, because they have six legs. And so we want to be able to tell the difference. And that just isn't pests and diseases. I probably should have added beneficials to that as well, because we need to be able to recognize them, not just in their adult stage, but in all their life stages. Uh, we want to choose when we do uh, have the option, resistant plants. Why plant something that's going to get sick or going to be especially attacked by a pest if you have a resistant variety? or resistance to uh, We want to be able, when possible, to exclude pests. Sometimes just some row cover over a planting uh, is just like a screen porch, and maybe you've got some vegetable greens growing in the vegetable garden. Uh, they're not going to get riddled with caterpillar and beetle holes if they've got a screen porch over them. Uh, there are other ways to do that. And then there's also some other non-spray options that we can use. Today's not a general talk on organic gardening or all the options in depth. I uh, certainly can't do that in 30 minutes, but I just want to mention that that's where it begins. Earth kind practices don't start with what do I spray. They start with these things I'm talking about now. Next is learn to recognize your beneficials in all their life stages. Maybe you know what a lady beetle looks like, but do you know what lady beetle larvae look like? Do you know what the different and there's more than one species of lady beetle, and the larvae aren't all identical. Uh, do you know what a lady beetle egg looks like? How about a lacewing egg or a surfid fly larva uh, or a parasitized aphid with a wasp inside? Recognizing all of those beneficials that are helping you helps you make a management decision. So when you walk out to a, a problem in the garden, uh, you not only recognize the pest, but you look around and say, you know what? Uh, nature is taking care of this, I'm going to step back, or nature's not taking care of it, I need to do something. Next is deciding whether treatments are needed. One hole in a spinach leaf is not a warrant to spray it. I don't care if you spray with synthetic or organic sprays, you don't need to spray for a spinach with a hole or two or three even in the leaves. Uh, there are times when treatments are needed. Uh, green bean plants, you can pull about 40% of the leaves off a green bean bush before you see an appreciable decline in production. So why worry about a bunch of bean, beans with holes in the leaves unless it hits that certain point where treatments are needed? The sooner you act, the softer your options. Uh, if you're looking at caterpillars, BT works well. If the caterpillars get old and they're about to turn into a moth, BT is not going to be very effective. Uh, effective. Uh, a lot of the pests, uh, nymphs of stink bugs, are more susceptible to some of our pesticides when they're young than when they're old. Plus, when they're young, they're all together without wings, and they're easy to go after. But when they get old and they're flying around everywhere, that's a problem. So act soon, don't delay. And finally, when we choose something, we want to choose something, of course, that's less toxic but also something that's less environmentally disruptive. And I, I like to use the analogy of grenades and arrows. An arrow flies through the crowd and hits one target, the pest, and doesn't damage any of the others standing around. A grenade lands in the middle and kills everything. And so seven dust would be an example of a grenade. You know, there's times when it can be an effective control, 
but whenever you use a grenade as opposed to an arrow, you're more likely to cause other problems. Uh, we, have, we have found in research that seven, as an example, that it's been around a long, long time, uh, uh, causes mite, spider mite outbreaks because the things that were keeping spider mites in control are also killed by the seven. And they've even found studies, and this is fascinating, but the spraying seven on leaves causes the mites that are there to be more active and to reproduce more and to become more of a problem. So it's almost like enhancing the mites, not just taking away their enemies. So common plant problems. We've got fungus problems. They're the most common uh, of all our plant diseases. Bacteria are also very common, but second to fungi when it comes to plant disease. Uh, viruses uh, are transmitted by insect. And by the way, fungi can be splashed. They can be brought in but they typically can also be carried on the air through spores. So you can have a rose bush that has no fungus on it. You put it in the middle of your yard and suddenly you get black spot because black spots in the air. Uh, bacteria on the other hand are primarily brought in uh, by either uh, splashing with water or by some other physical transport unless they came in with the plant itself. And then nematodes are something we often overlook because they're underground and roots are the one of the places we need to start. So let's look at some of the fungal pathogens. We can have leaf spots. We can have blights that just kill out sections of a plant or a leaf, cankers that attack the, the tree trunks or uh, other, other uh, typically woody species. And then we can also have wilts and root rots. Uh, this picture of a tomato at the bottom, uh, we have two primary wilts in the soil, verticillium and fusarium. And uh, I don't know if my cursor is showing, if you, somebody could let me know that, I'd appreciate it. But if you look in the center of this sliced tomato stem, you see the healthy green interior and then some of the white material around it. Uh, and see this brown streaking and down here, the brown streaking, uh, that is the evidence of a fungal wilt, fusarium, uh, verticillium or two of our primary examples. And they basically are plugging up the plumbing of that plant. So leaf spots, most fungal leaf spots are circular, but they can also be irregular. Now, one of the hesitations I have in putting pictures up is almost anything I say, <laughs> there are exceptions to. So don't just say all fung fungal spots have to be round. That's not true, but generally it's true. And because they're spreading through hyphae through the leaf, think of it as root strands growing through the leaf, they just move out in all directions. Uh, they typically brown, reddish, purple color. Typically, they're random. If you see spots that are in a line or spots that are only on the edge of the leaf or something like that, that's probably not a fungal spot because think about the spores floating through the air. They're landing randomly, and when the leaf is moist, they begin to grow. Uh, often, fungal spots have a yellow halo, and sometimes when you look in the center, and I'll use this spot up at the top, uh, if we were to zoom in really close, you may see a little row of black bumps, like a mountain range of volcanoes in a circle. Uh, and then inside that, another row of black bumps. And what happens is just like the fairy rings in your yard that pop up the little white mushrooms, the mushroom grows out and then it sends up fruiting structures, which in this case aren't mushrooms, but they're little volcano-like bumps that produce spores, it grows out further and it sends up another ring of fruiting structures. Not all fungal spots have that, but if you get a hand lens and see that, that's a good indication that you're dealing with a fungus. Bacterial pathogens uh, don't have that strand growing through the leaf, they're individual bacteria. And so they tend to be bordered by the leaf veins. As a result, bacteria are typically angular. You can see in the bottom left picture, it shows up really well. And in the top right picture, this geranium leaf, uh, the bacteria have infected it, but it's not growing across the vein. So we typically get angular spots, or in this case, V-shaped blighted areas on the leaf that would be typical of bacteria. But all of the things in with the little dots on the left, uh, leaf spots, blights, cankers, wilts, and root rots, were the same as for fungus. Bacteria can cause all of that as well. There's a tomato bacteria that plugs the plumbing. And when you slice through the stem, you don't see the brown streaks like the fungal uh, uh, vascular disease. But if you put it in water, you'll see the bacteria streaming out. Uh, almost like if you put sugar in water and you see that little swirl 
uh, as the sugar dissolves into the water, uh, that's what it looks like coming out of a tomato stem. Bacteria can also plug the plumbing, as we said, and uh, the more common one we deal with here is bacterial leaf scorch or xylella. Uh, you see it on uh, sycamore, you see it on a lot of plants, a lot of native plants, red buds can get it, uh, the oleanders can get it. It's the disease called Pierce's disease that is the reason it took so Texas so long to actually have a wine grape industry here because Pierce's disease wiped out most of our early wine grape plantings. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is nematodes. Uh, nematodes are tiny microscopic worms that move into a root and cause these knots. Uh, it looks like a string of pearls or a snake that swallowed a rabbit. So when you, when you see a nematode knot, uh, it's different than the, the growth on the root caused on a legume by a nitrogen nodule in that legumes are attached to the side of the root but nematode nodules are more in the root. Again, like this on the far left here, it's almost like a snake that swallowed a rabbit that's inside. And, and that's typical of nematodes. Plus, nitrogen nodules are pink on the inside when you cut through them, if they're an active nodule. And nematodes, of course, are not. Uh, they, they proliferate in the soil. They love okra and many other things. Here's a picture of some tomatoes. Uh, the ones on the left are have the VFN after the name, indicating they don't get or they're resistant to verticillium and fusarium, uh, at least the standard strains of it. Uh, and then they're also resistant to nematode damage. Uh, the ones on the left are not. So what we're seeing here could be verticillium, fusarium, nematodes, or a combination of all of them working on these plants. Uh, but that's again a good example of why resistance is so important. Viruses uh, are vectored in. Think of a mosquito that carries malaria from one person to another. Uh, these insects will feed on the leaves of a weed, perhaps, that has a virus, and then they come in and feed on your squash or your tomatoes, and they inject that virus, that disease, into the plant, and it moves to the growing tips of the plant where it deforms the leaves. Virus deformations are on the newest growth, at least initially. These old leaves that have fully formed are not going to twist up because of a virus because they've already formed. Now, you can have viruses that cause splotching and discoloration or ring spots or other things in leaves. There's a, a wide variety of virus symptoms, but, but almost always it starts with a new growth like this. Uh, here's a pepper that's been growing with a virus for a while. If you look down at the bottom of the plant, you see healthy leaves. But out here at the end, there's a lot of problems. And the viruses, there's no sprays. We just have to rogue them out. Herbicide injury looks a lot like virus in some cases. Um, when we start to treat our lawns for broadleaf weed control, those products can get into our trees. Here's a live oak with a hormone type weed killer injury. See the little twisted tips of the leaves um, malformed. Uh, here's a tomato with herbicide injury, but that also looks a lot like virus. And when you're looking at tomatoes, every year we get quite a few calls on tomatoes that are having this twisty top kind of symptom. And we have to ask a lot of questions to try to figure out what it is. Uh, is it happening to just one plant or is it happening to the whole row? Uh, so if, a, if herbicides are, are used, it may be that the sprayer was contaminated, so all the plants would show symptoms. If you just see one plant here or one plant there, probably not herbicide, uh, although it could be, uh, but more likely a virus symptom when it's spotty through the field, if you will, or down the row. Uh, but herbicides, maybe this uh, mulch around the tomatoes had a broadleaf weed control used in the pasture before that hay was, was harvested. And so all the tomatoes down the row that were mulched would show that herbicide injury. Let's talk about insects a little bit. Uh, insect mouth parts are our first clue to what, who done it, to who's chewing on our stuff. Uh, grasshoppers, caterpillars, and beetles all have chewing mouth parts. They eat away leaves. Thrips have rasping mouth parts. If you've got a, one of those reciprocal saws that has a blade with teeth on one side that goes in and out and in and out, that's kind of like a thrips mouth part. They literally just rip open tissues in the leaf and lap up uh, the contents. Uh, and then sucking mouth parts would be aphids, whiteflies, scale, 
uh, scale insects and true bugs like stink bugs and plant bugs. They're like the mosquito. They put their mouth in and they suck the juices out. But in doing that, they often inject something that's toxic to the leaf that causes discolored spots from their feeding. So those of you down on the Gulf Coast probably unfortunately know what uh, citrus leaf miner looks like. That's the top left. Uh, you see these leaves. If you look real close at this leaf at the top center, it's got little pathways through it that with a little black lines through it. So this thing, uh, let me go to the bottom center. This is a leaf miner mine as well. You can see the leaf miner better here. The small end is where it started off. And as the insect grows, it gets bigger and bigger. And so the tunnel gets bigger and bigger. And so if you're looking for a leaf miner, they're gonna be feeding here at the large end, or that may be one right there inside that. If you look close, you can see them. Uh, but the little black trails through your citrus leaves, that's leaf miner poop as they're eating the leaves and leaving their excrement behind, it leaves that little black line through there. Of course, caterpillars uh, on our kale, this Toscano kale has caterpillar damage to it. And then the bottom left is beetle damage. Again, it's hard to generalize. Caterpillars can make holes in leaves, but usually when we see individual little holes, my first thought is a beetle. When you start to see the edges of the leaf eaten in or large sections of the leaf like this Toscano kale eaten, that's more typical of a caterpillar. You want to turn the leaves over and see if you can catch them at it. If you don't see anything, go out at night with a flashlight and turn leaves over. Some pests tend to feed more nocturnally, so that if you're never able to figure out what's going on, check that. Also with these kind of pests, look at the edge of the damage. Uh, if you look at the edge and it's brown, like it's dried a little bit, that's older damage. And it may be that you're just now noticing the damage, but the pest is long gone. Maybe some wasp came in and hauled off the caterpillar that was doing that to the kale leaf. Uh, and so there's no need to spray. Uh, but, but look how fresh the damage is, and uh, that helps you make the decision. When caterpillars are small, their mouths are too small to eat leaves, and all they can do is chew the spongy mesophyll off the surface. Uh, that leaves this kind of damage. This is called skeletonization. It almost looks like a little window pane through there. As caterpillars get bigger, they're able to eat more of the leaf where they're able to chew away everything but the big veins. And then they get another set of jaws as they molt again, and they can actually eat the whole leaf. So all of these leaves were damaged by the same species of caterpillar. On the left, this is when the caterpillar first hatched out. That's about all the damage it could do is eat the spongy green stuff off the, in this case, the bottom of the leaf. A little bit bigger jaws. Now we're starting to see the lace-like effect and then bigger jaws and bigger jaws and so on. So that also tells you where you are in, in the process. So if you're checking your plants out and you catch it here, uh, it may be that the whole group of caterpillars is just on that leaf. I've seen that before. And you just pick the leaf off and you're done. Or if you use BT or even insecticidal soap at this stage would kill them. But as they get, as they get older, those options become much less effective. Other chewing insects, grasshoppers and grubs. Uh, and I just put this in at the bottom just to say, uh, this is a leaf feeding beetle. Beetles, like lady beetles, have larvae that look like little alligators in most cases. And this little larva down here is the larva of this uh, yellow margin leaf beetle. And these love our greens. You'll see these on your, on your um, uh, cruciferous crops, the, like mustard, for example, and um, Chinese cabbage, they like that, and, and a lot of other things. But it's not just the adult we're going after, but also, in this case, the larva that's eating these holes uh, in the leaf. Now, this is the fun part. Um, entomological scatology. You know, there are actually entomologists who specialize in bug poop. <laughs> they, uh, and they, they're often brought on the scenes of a crime uh, where they can actually look when they're going through all the, you know, the clothing on the victim or something, and they found them in the woods, and, and they bring in entomologists that can tell all kinds of fascinating things. Uh, we have a guy up here at Texas A&M that is, that's his specialty, and he is a, he's a forensic entomologist, uh, so they can look at a body and determine exactly what season it was killed in or what part of the world or the country based on the types of insects that were emerging at this or that time. Pretty fascinating stuff. But entomological scatology is interesting because when you see the droppings from something, that tells you what the pest is. 
if it's a lace bug on your azaleas or on your bur oaks or on your sycamores, for example, you're going to see little black tar spots, shiny tar spots under the leaf. That's the poop of that bud. Uh, this is a pine sawfly poop. It looks like a little hay bale at an angle stacked up, but based on the ridges and the poop, they can determine which pest did it. How many of you remember Play-Doh as a kid? Remember the little Play-Doh fun factory? You put a star or a moon or whatever inside and that's what you got? Well, forgive me for doing this at lunchtime, but that's basically what we're talking about. Uh, it's, it's basically looking at the patterns in the bug frass and being able to tell the difference. Now, whether or not you get down to that level of it, you can tell the difference between caterpillar poop and beetle poop, between uh, lace bug poop and caterpillar poop and so on. So sometimes it's even a little bit of that entomological scatology that we're doing. Spider mites, uh, hot weather, boy, are they ever a problem. This is the two-spotted spider mite. Uh, th this is a leaf that is just loaded with them. And there's a lot of little round, shiny eggs in here for the spider mite. Uh, they create a little fine webbing. Uh, when they're really bad like this that you can see. Uh, you can blast them off with water, use some insecticidal soap on them. Uh, there's a lot of different soft options for spider mites. You just want to get in there early before it hits this stage because there's not much left there to save. We mentioned thrips had, have rap, rasping mouth parts. I probably should have put a picture of a rose in here because they love to rasp the petals of roses. Uh, they also get on our onions and cause this kind of pattern of damage on the onion. If you want to see thrips, the best way to see thrips is when you get the little yellow primroses, the roadside flowers. The, some, some people in Texas call them buttercups, not the best name for them, but uh, the, the little pink primroses. Uh, if you pick any of those and look carefully at the flower, you'll see little long brown insects running around and those are thrips. That's the easiest way to to see what one, lo one looks like. When we have city mold, that's caused by insects that are essentially sucking the carbohydrate rich juices out of a plant in that sugary sap and peeing out the sugary substance, which falls on the leaves and then the, the city mold grows on that. So I'm looking here at what looks to be a bay tree, uh, the bay laurel, the herb, and uh, their spice. And all that soot means underneath these leaves, there's probably either aphids or mealybugs or scale or whiteflies or one of these honeydew producing insects. It could also mean that there's a tree above them that has those insects and the honeydew is falling onto this plant. So turn the leaves over and look around and find the culprit. Uh, here's what a lace bug looks like. Uh, these are all true bugs. They have piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, lace bugs, look like they're made out of uh, little shiny plexiglass panels with black and, and gray markings and brown markings on them. Uh, if you don't know what a lace bug looks like, find a sycamore that has bronze leaves right now and turn it upside down and you will see a lot of them because they are really hammering our sycamores this time of year. Stink bugs, leaf-footed bugs at the bottom right. Uh, here, here is a uh, look, probably a leaf-footed bug that uh, is uh, in a nymph stage, it doesn't have wings yet. And if you have tomatoes, you know stink bugs are public enemy number one, and so you got to deal with those. Uh, but they're easy to control at this stage. You can just knock them into a pail of soapy water because they can't fly away. Chinch bugs, we're entering chinch bug season. Uh, late July and August, and early September, they do this to lawns. Typically, they start in the sun. Typically, they move into the, the green grass. As the grass starts to lose color, it looks like it needs watering. Uh, these are all the different forms of chinch bugs. There's, there, that's all the same species. It's just nymphs versus older adults. Uh, and another characteristic of chinch bugs is, look at this weed over here on the left. When you see weeds that are healthy green and the rest of the lawn looks like it needs water, that's probably not water that's the problem. And in this case, it is chinch bugs. They love St. Augustine, um, and but that, that's just one of the pests we deal with in summer. Scale come in soft scale and armored scale. Um, you can't go by the name soft and armored to know what it is. This is actually a soft scale on Burford Holly. Uh, notice how these guys have set up shop right on the vein so they can suck right out of the main pipeline there. Uh, and they create sooty mill. In fact, the soft scales 
produce sooty mold. So when you see the black, that's going to be most likely a soft scale. Uh, then there are armored scale. They they also do damage, but they don't produce the sooty mold. This is crepe myrtle bark scale down here on the bottom right. And scale produce babies that crawl out from under them called crawlers. And one monoscale can produce a lot of offspring. So scale problems go from almost invisible to a major problem really quick. Gall farming insects, so many different types of galls, uh, the uh, meliote gall, uh, the blackberry nipple gall, they're just, the finger galls on elm, they're just a lot of different types of galls. The bottom line on gall insects is they take a little energy from the plant to grow the gall, but not enough worth trying to treat. And you'd have to spray and spray and spray, nuking your plants all the time, trying to trying to kill the galls, it's not worth it. One thing I do want to mention, though, is we're talking about all the pests, but remember, it's not just you versus the pest. Uh, Paul Winsky is going to be doing a program coming up on beneficial insects, so I'm not going to go into those much now, but uh, you definitely want to stay tuned for that one. But these scale insects on the left, see that exit hole? They have had a parasitoid inside that basically took that scale out. These aphids have exit holes. They've had an, a parasitoid aphid inside that took them out. So I want you to look at this picture. Some of you have heard me talk. I've seen this one 100 times. But uh, how many beneficial insects do you see? The pest here is the yellow aphid. Can you think, I'll let you think about that for just a moment. There's a lady beetle larva. There's a parasitized aphid. Every tan brown aphid on this leaf has a wasp inside or had one. And there's actually two surfeit fly larvae. Here's one of them. I'm going to pause right here for a moment, Paul. And are there some questions that we can answer? I see Kirsten ask, is that white fly on the leaf? These white things in the picture are the cast skins of aphids. So they molt also. And you can see some over here by my hands at the end of the leaf. But all along, this is all this is all dead aphid skins, just like a snake sheds its skin. Uh, a lot of times insects do, too. All right, well, we're going to get going again. Uh, so I'm going to just come back to these. I'm not going to read them all to you again. But these are all the practices that are important in an earth kind garden. If you're an organic gardener, the products you use would be organic. Uh, if you uh, don't care whether you're gardening organically or not, you still want to do all these things and choose products, even synthetic products, that are less disruptive and less toxic, uh, for example. Now, I want to show you something I find kind of cool. Uh, there are a lot of good identification tools out there, uh, but one that I use all the time is a simple jeweler's loop, which is about a $10 item online. Uh, you can buy little magnifiers that clip to your cell phone. Those are great. Uh, I've tried different ones, and some are okay, some are not so great. Uh, but look at this jeweler's loop, and I'm magnifying a penny. That's Mr. Lincoln's head right there. There's his nose. Uh, your cell phone is an incredible microscope. You can get over, well over 60 power with your cell phone uh, by just uh, following it that way. And I'm going to do something now. Uh, Paul, I'm going to try to stop sharing for one moment. So I'm going to run this micro, this uh, thing here. It's, it's without sound. Right there is a cocoon of an insect that's about the size of a grain of rice that I found on my red rushing kale. Here's my cell phone trying to zoom in on it. And if I get so close, I can't quite get it to focus because my cell phone is too close. Remember, this is the size of a grain of rice. So I'm going to put the hand loop in front of the lens of the cell phone. And then I can get much closer to focus. And then by using that pinching motion that we've learned how to use to make things even bigger, I want you to know this is a big Samsung Note cell phone. I want you to see how large this grain of rice size insect uh, becomes. Now we've zoomed to about four times. Now we're up to six times. But with the loop, that's actually about 60 times. But that, that's the grain of rice. Watch as he move away, the little thing moves here. See it? <laughs> uh, so that was a living uh, insect inside there. Another identification tool I just want to mention is um, Google Lens. If you've not used Google Lens, uh, one of our entomologists in East Texas kind of discovered it as far as uh, we, we, we were concerned in Harris County. And then uh, Paul told me about it. And uh, 
it's an app that's on Android phones. This is what it looks like right there on your phone. But it's also in the Google Assistant. It's also in Google Photos. And so if, if you have a an Apple phone, you can you can also have Google Lens and it's in, in the Google app in the store also. But, but Google Lens allows you to point at whatever is uh, in front of you and it'll identify it. I, it. It can read foreign language for you if you got a little book you wanna read. Uh, it can uh, identify uh, some object you wanna purchase, you know, like a, uh, uh, a purse or a, a new shirt or, or something like that. It'll tell you where to get it and find it. But the cool thing horticulturally is it's pretty good at identifying plants and insects. You got to get a really good picture where it's clear to Google Lens what you're wanting it to identify in the picture. Just a bug among the leaves, it's not going to pick out. And it gets it wrong a lot, but I've been amazed at how many times it gets it right. So if you haven't tried Google Lens, that is one of the tools I'd recommend you consider. If you have an insect you want identified, uh, ask an entomologist dot tamu dot edu ask an entomologist all one word uh, this is the web page you can uh, you can send in insect specimens uh, these guys ask that we emphasize that they're not there to answer questions from curious folks but they're there to solve problems so the, if every texan saw a bug and sent in a i just wonder what that is uh, it would inundate them and they're, they're not set up to handle that uh, but if you have uh, an insect image, you can click on complete this form here and you attach the image, you give your name, your contact information, where you saw it, what it was on, and answer their questions. And an entomologist will look at that picture and get back to you. So that is a service that's available. But again, don't go out today bug hunting and send them 20 bugs that you kind of wonder what they are. Uh, they're just not gonna be able to handle that. If you wanna take a plant sample, uh, you want to make sure that the sample is sick, but not dead, to send into the plant clinic. Uh, they do diagnosis, not autopsies. So uh, go to that zone between healthy and dead. If it is a uh, unusual plant and it has some spots on the leaves or whatever, attach a healthy leaf because, you know, some of our natural variegations and splotchiness that's normal in a leaf, uh, it helps them to be able to see what normal should be as well as the disease. These are plant pathologists that will be looking at it. Put it in a Ziploc, name, phone number, and all of that so they know who to contact. Uh, here's the plant disease lab. Uh, all our AM addresses are .tamu.edu. So the other one was ask an entomologist. This is plant clinic. Very simple, plant clinic, uh, plant clinic. And uh, you, it costs 35 bucks to have a sample done. Uh, and that works That works well. They look at it under a microscope. They may culture it out in a Petri dish. They will give you the definitive answer. If you just want kind of a quick answer, there are folks, uh, including us agents, uh, that go, if you go to ask.extension.org slash ask, you can ask questions and attach up to three well-focused photos. Please notice the underlying words, well-focused. We get a lot of fuzzy stuff that the camera focused on something behind it and, and we just can't help with that. So the better your photo, the better your answer will be. There's no charge for that service. I uh, just wanna let you know about it. I mentioned weeds would be part of our program and we're gonna wind up real quick now on weeds. Um, the simplest way I know of to manage weeds other than hand pulling or hoeing uh, is to use newspaper. And I think this is even easier. Uh, here's a row on the left of crabgrass in the summer that is just taken over a bed and we lay newspaper, we wet the newspaper, overlap the newspaper, and then throw any kind of a mulch on top and it keeps it from burning. Uh, I mean, excuse me, it keeps it from popping through the newspaper and for the newspaper from blowing away. Uh, the the um, uh, importance of wetting it is you wanna wet the weeds first because once you do this to weeds, they're, gonna, they're not gonna have light, they're gonna die and they're gonna rot really rapidly underneath. When newspaper uh, is, it, when you haven't done it early, like here's the row on on the left that we did the newspaper to later, and now see how the crabgrass has gotten larger. Uh, you can use a weed eater or a lawnmower and take it down. Uh, hoeing and hand pulling all of that would be a lot of work, but here's the wet newspaper with dry newspaper, and then they're just going to throw more weeds on. When you've done that at the end. You've got your mulch, you've got your newspaper, and you've got dead weeds under the paper. You can just throw 
a um, couple of seeds down in there or stick a transplant in. If you use seeds, throw a handful of mulch on the top and your plants will come right through. Uh, it's, it's all that weed became decomposing organic matter. You can do this to ornamental beds. Here's a bed out near the street of a home that has uh, a lot of grass and weeds going into the bed. So we just take newspaper, put it underneath the desirable plants and around them and wet it. And then in this case, because it was out front, we threw mulch, uh, it was composty mulch on top so that it looked good. So uh, that's, um, that's the, the easiest way I know to get rid of weeds that will not control nut sedge. It pops through newspaper. Nut sedge I've seen pop through newly laid asphalt. So that's a whole nother monster. Uh, Bermuda grass will crawl around underneath there looking for light. And when it finds it, it'll pop through. But as long as there's at least four to six sheets of newspaper, uh, it takes about that many, uh, it'll keep them out. The newspaper eventually rots and just becomes part of the soil also. So we're gonna stop uh, and ask uh, if you guys have any questions. Uh, and then I just wanna put in one more plug for the upcoming programs.